Hi everyone, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm Senior Technology Editor at the Journal of Commerce and JOC.com and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, thank you so much to Flexport for uh, inviting me to take part in this discussion, the future of global trade technology. Uh, the, this topic is obviously near and dear to my heart. It's something I cover and think about uh, pretty much 24 seven these days. We're in sort of, as you all have heard uh, over the last, uh, few sessions, uh, we are in unprecedented times and, and technology I feel has always had a role to play in this industry, uh, never more so than now. So we have two fantastic speakers joining us uh, today to, to, for us to sort of provide a framework for how we think about the role that technology can play in pushing our industry forward. My name is James, I'm Chief Technology Officer at Flexport, in charge of pretty much all the different technology teams, whether it's IT, product development, or even our integration services, as well as the data scientist team. Um, so I've been here about two and a half years, uh, you know, really love, enjoyed the space because before that I was also in charge of Amazon Global Logistics or Amazon, uh, was also a pretty fun entrepreneur, you know, sort of helped start and sold two companies. I love startup, love big company, and, and it's a really awesome space to be in at this time. Great. Uh, yeah, a little background on yourself, Convoy. Yeah, absolutely. James, Eric, great to join you both today. My name is Ziad Ismail. I run the product team at Convoy that includes product management, data science, and design. Uh, I've been with Convoy since 2016, so about five years. Prior to Convoy, I spent a couple years at Microsoft and then a couple years building two of my own companies. I've spent most of my background in uh, software marketplaces, and now we're applying a bunch of those lessons to uh, the truck market and reinventing trucking. Cool. Well, you guys are sitting in really interesting roles uh, and have obviously varied uh, backgrounds that apply directly to what we're going to be talking about today. Before we jump into the session, uh, we do have a legal disclaimer um, that I have to show. So here goes. With that out of the way, let's dive right into our discussion. There's lots that I wanted to ask James and, and Ziad. So um, a bit of background. Uh, there are forces at play um, that predated the pandemic that we're all sort of still uh, dealing with the ramifications of. Um, Ecom, fast and free shipping expectations, tariffs, which used to be the buzzword before COVID. Uh, and now what we're seeing a lot of is uh, carbon reduction mandates, both commercially driven and regulatory driven mandates um, that shippers and all their service providers are, are uh, sort of having to grapple with. So with all these complications in the background, we have a whole bunch of companies that see a huge opportunity to scale as providers of, of uh, products uh, around the world. Um, and so there's, there's this opportunity in front of a lot of them, but also so many challenges. So the first question I had, and maybe I'll start with you, James, is, one area that I become sort of fascinated with is uh, this idea that communication and coordination in our industry is somewhat broken. Um, if not broken, it's, it's, it's kind of needs a little bit of fixing. Um, and, and that's, you know, one of the things that's really hit me in the face is how reliant the industry still is on, for instance, email for coordinating shipments. So let's just jump straight into the, 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 the issue of email and sort of communication and collaboration, uh, sorry, coordination between parties um, and, and, and sort of figure out, are, is there, are there solutions to solve this? Um, and what's sort of been historically the constraint or hindrance on, on adoption of those, of those solutions? Yeah, sounds good, Eric. You know, I think of, because we're dealing with, with uh, the physical world, right? I think a lot of stuff that's happening uh, is always outside of the system. And that's part of the reasons why, you know, I think a lot of information that we typically think of can be automated uh, comes in different forms, whether it's phone, you know, now it's email or chat and stuff like that. And I think it's going to be pretty hard to get away from it, um, at least for a while still, right? So ideally, if it's a large company that, um, or carrier or logistic service provider industry, hopefully they have a great process in the system they're augmenting. Um, to, to automatically send and communicate. But reality, I think when exception happens, you know, you want to get information out and email, or I think in some part of the world, you know, instant message is actually the best uh, collaboration uh, or information method. Um, of course, you know, something that we have already been doing for many years now at Flexport uh, is really trying to figure out how to provide a collaboration system via messaging that can take input from email, from mobile phone, from website, 
and, and really try to bring around a certain context uh, for collaboration. So, so for me, I, I think we have to embrace it as uh, you know, any of the input right, that exists out there. And the goal is trying to figure out how can we uh, convert it into a digital format that can be more widely shared and more importantly in context. So uh, one of the things that's been helping out a lot is really the cost of technology to build applications uh, and connect the world together. So, you know, couple, was it over a decade ago, right? The server costs themselves have been going down. But now I think with a lot of rapid uh, application development or sometimes even no-code technology, is really getting an easy way out to provide a new interface, I think, for people to input data. Um, so hopefully email might be a structured email in the future that can <laughs> make things a little bit better than uh, just pure email. Yeah. Yeah. Jad, I'd love your thoughts on this too. I agree with James that one of the big challenges is that there are so many different things that can happen. So standardizing the work and the, the interop between different systems becomes complicated. However, I think it's a step that we do need to take as an industry. And I think we need to, we need to push there quickly. The reason for that is that in the current system, there's this tension between the desire for more efficiency, meaning you know fewer buffers, less waiting time, and still having a resilient supply chain, which is as things are changing, the supply chain shouldn't fall apart. And communication is the basic building block of that, which is if what you need is faxes, emails, phone calls, and humans to make decisions, then when you have these rapid changes in the environment, the system just can't react fast enough. It can't pick up the signals. It can't infer what's going to happen. It can't take action. Um, and so you get a supply chain that either is very wasteful or a supply chain that isn't resilient. Um, we're seeing that now with COVID, that's on everybody's mind because it's kind of a global issue and it's impacting all the supply chains, but it's happened every single year that I've looked at supply chains. It's been you know wildfires, tariffs, hurricanes, and other things. And so I do think it's a critical building block for us to solve and for this industry to get to the next level innovation, it's gotta get past emails. It's gotta become APIs. It's gotta become standardized interfaces. Yeah, I think one of this issue, the reason I wanted to kick off with this issue is this, it's become kind of really like crystallized in my head how, you know, the chain, a chain reaction of events can result from something as simple as, uh, you know, a, a document going to the wrong email address and, and the, oh, the yeah. knock on effects and delays that that mm -hmm. has, you know, spider webbing out into, you know, an inability to get capacity and then running into, you know, areas of congestion that were that were already soaking up uh, resources. And, and so now you have double the resources that are needed in an already resource constrained environment. So um, what you guys are describing is, is super interesting. And, and James, especially, uh, you know, this is an area I focus on a lot is kind of technologies that enable people to sort of live in the process that they're in right now until they can transition over. So that sort of Rosetta Stone approach or, or MacGyver type of approach to things is super interesting to me. What, um, how do we, as we think about the need for the industry to move to a sort of more coordinated communication environment, how do you incentivize people to try new things when they're not necessarily incentivized to do so right now? And Ziada, maybe I'll start with you on this one. I think this moment actually does create a lot of incentive for companies to shift. Um, it's coming from a couple of directions. First is every company is feeling the distortions and the challenges with their supply chains right now. There's also in many markets, including the US, um, there are just challenges finding labor. That might be people to run your supply chain internally or people to work in your warehouses. So what companies, what we hear from companies is that they are looking for solutions that are going to help them be more efficient, be more resilient, and ideally uh, find a solution that is going to help them out of the current resource crunch they have in terms of finding people. The, the key thing becomes to not just sell technology to these companies because no company is looking for technology. They're looking for a solution to a problem they have right now. So if you can demonstrate how technology actually helps you solve what they're running into, we're actually seeing a lot of interest right now in adopting direct integrations through APIs with Convoy, 
uh, integration into their existing systems, kind of adding supplemental capabilities that they don't have already. I think what's happening in the industry is going to be a big accelerant of the technology wave uh, right now in supply chains. Hmm. Interesting. James? Yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, efficiency is definitely one of the motivators, right? Like if we can leverage technology to lower costs of coordination and or even operations good. But the other part, I think, is really just uh, providing a, an awesome user experience, right? Like the single version of the truth of what's happening. And, and I think as um, each company or the collaboration between multiple companies are able to provide this new value, especially in global logistics or logistic coordination, right? I think that's a natural incentive for people to adopt new technology, new information or new applications uh, because the traditional way is just so hard. There's so much stuff moving around and who can bring together that awesome end experience as well as you know, providing the facts or the data authorities to know what is reality right now that people can, can use. You know, those are, um, I think, the motivators we can do. And of course, you know, I think through various partnerships and alliances out there, um, I, I think that sort of helps um, provide a little bit more focus on certain type of problem you want to solve as a company and, and you know, a, a group of companies together that really is uh, provide really good incentives for, for that micro uh, area, right? So hopefully if we all do across the industry, collectively, we're actually moving the needle a little bit more. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the thinking about how to use technology to lower these barriers is, is a, a great incentive by itself. I think historically what happens is there hasn't been that much uh, investment in the space. So uh, most of the stuff in logistics can be solved manually. So, so I think as a simple backup, right, people just naturally gravitate to it, even though they don't like it, even though it's very tedious, but you can do it. Um, and, and in order to do it correctly, it requires a lot of you know, investment, right? Especially in tech and processes. So, so over the last, I think, uh, um, five plus years, there's a lot of investment in the space. So hopefully, you know, a lot of these um, new companies coming here or existing ones who has new funding as well, we have this focus um, to finally change it. So, so I think there is investment involved, right? And, and the cost of it is also going down. So I think uh, besides the market motivators, uh, these are the factor. I think it's finally going to move the needle a little bit. Um, for this industry. Yeah, that's always been the sort of holy grail, right, is, is figuring out processes that don't require throwing a bunch of people at it, but actually, you know, a, a program that can address things that, that you know, aren't really tr tremendously value add. Well, let's, and James, you gave a little, a little window into this, but I want to expand out a little further. One thing I think about a lot is what in the current kind of technology infrastructure environment has enabled what's gone on in the last five years. Yes, there's been lots of venture capital. Yes, there's been lots of really uh, interesting people, very intelligent people who've gravitated to our industry like in never before in terms of volume and, and founders and numbers. But there's also some technology infrastructure things that have happened in the background that are enabling a lot of this. What would you say is, point? what would you point to in terms of something that's like really fundamentally changed the way uh, bringing solutions to market um, ha ha happens these days? Yeah, I think there's sort of um, two major uh, technology at work today. So, so one is really the, um, the, the ease of sending information across systems, whether it's API or, you know, it's traditionally it's EDI, right? Or API. Now, now it's even, you know, let's say even email or PDFs. Um, I, I think the cost of building technology to sort of parse and digitize it is fairly low. Uh, it'd be awesome if there's a standard, then I think you can go even faster, right? But even though there are no standard, the cost of leveraging technology to normalize data um, is, it's uh, at a, you know, we leverage that a lot at FlexBar, so it definitely is there. So we can see how we can aggregate a bunch of information together and provide that version of truth through machine learning on, hey, three data points, this is this, which one's correct? Well, we have a model to, to let us know. And the other one is a little bit more interesting. It's moving much slower, but, I can definitely see at some point, probably less than five years, it's going to tip. And, and what is in the it provides the answer to what is happening inside a building. And these are uh, uh, robotics automations, right? So there are even warehouses where potentially 50% of operations has been automated. And even terminals, I think mostly in Europe, uh, that have automated terminals as well. So you're getting all these sort of real-time data points from these systems that can be sent out versus historically, if you have humans working on it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you might be able to scan in real time, but a lot of times you got to sort of key in to get that info. 
Um, so, so I think having robots to augment human sources uh, is the other big trend that you can already see. And some of the you know, company that has a lot of money can do it, but hopefully in five years, even the, the middle-sized company can, can take advantage of some tech provider. Um, so now the ability to see uh, real-time action, you know, uh, did it re receive within a warehouse, right? Did it put on a dock? You know, there's a lot of these details you really need to be efficient with logistics. So through robotics, it could happen. And, and, and that, yeah, just somehow a company out there, a mobile company, continues to suck in data and, and pre present that view for, for the world. So, so I think those are the um, two major things I see. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, those, those, those are great. Um, I would, I would think of, uh, there are a couple that I think have been big enablers. So one is, you know, the, the iPhone was introduced in 2007. I think many people probably think of it as a consumer technology first, but by the time Convoy was founded in 2015, essentially every truck driver had a smartphone in their um, in, in, their, in their truck, uh, either an iPhone or an Android phone at that point with a data plan. What that meant is that there was this ubiquitous computing platform with lots of sensors that you can now deliver rich applications to. Before the iPhone, it wasn't possible to really connect that whole part of the supply chain. You'd have to put in place your own technology, your own radio. It would be very, very expensive to do. Um, that's, that's been a major revolution. I think the other one is just because supply chains are um, so driven by lots of signals, lots of things changing constantly, machine learning and statistical techniques and just the maturation of that technology has been very powerful. Uh, and it's something we use extensively uh, at, at Convoy. Those I think are, are two, um, two technologies that have, have been key to Convoy's growth and I think are key to supply chains in general. Yep. Interesting. Um, I, I'm clearly a, a few degrees behind both of you guys in terms of uh, computing and, and mathematics stuff, but I, I feel like if I can interject, I feel like we've sort of lost track a little bit of how important just basic things like cloud computing have been, how transformational they've been. I've been reporting on this industry for almost two decades. And at the beginning of that time, the idea that making a booking on a container vessel you could do that through an online platform that, you know, who you didn't know was ultimately controlling that platform was a major step for a lot of the industry, right? So we've come a long way, obviously, but none of this stuff happens if there weren't those foundational things on the cloud. It's quite obvious at this point, right? If you're, especially if you're in building, you know, really, really sophisticated technology, but uh, Ziad, you mentioned the, the iPhone was transformational, I think even, even further back just, just the advent of cloud has been, has meant so much. Um, I also see uh, the ease with which companies can kind of uh, put their, put their sort of platforms or pieces of their platform together. Um, and, and again, I'm not the one to opine about how this all works. You guys are far greater than that, but uh, that to me seems totally transformational as too. Not that partnerships were, were a new thing in our industry, but the, the rapidity with which they can be, you know, put together and, and, and taken to market, I think is absolutely become a lot faster. And that's a good lead in you, your two companies sort of partnered together um, a few months ago. And, and this is something, as I mentioned, that I'm seeing really across the industry in a, in a volume that we've never seen before. Let's step back and maybe think what's sort of behind all of this um, platform uh, and, and partnership activity. And, and is this kind of part of the, the platformization of the logistics industry? Ziad, why don't you take first crack at this one? Yeah, certainly. So I, I think there are two things going on. I think there's a general trend and then, you know, specifically around Flexport and Convoy and what we're trying to do. I think the general trend is that many companies already have existing supply chain solutions. They're not starting from scratch. This isn't the first time they're getting into this space. They've made these investments and, you know, anybody who has looked at ERP solutions or kind of these complicated enterprise installations knows that once you've made those investments, you're unlikely to want to rip those out. Um, these companies want 
the new things that technology can provide, all the new innovations that are coming. And so the easiest way is to meet customers where they are, is to create those integration points into these pieces of software so they can take advantage of Flexport, Convoy, and other technology solutions in the workflow, financial systems, and other things that they've already set up inside their organization. Um, that I think is just going to continue. These platforms are going to keep opening up and they're going to build new capabilities uh, in their core technology. And they're also, also going to open up for third parties to enhance what they have. And then with Flexport and Convoy and the partnership, that's just a continuation, I think, of, of that trend. But I think there are some special things that we're trying to do. Convoy and Flexport share DNA in that we're both kind of technology first companies. What we can do with technology is, I think we can really push the boundaries of how these integrations can come together. It's both about visibility. We both operate in slightly different parts, adjacent parts of the supply chain. But the idea is that you can track a shipment from you know, manufacturing somewhere abroad, all the way over on a ship, and then the transportation leg, and then final delivery to, um, to a store in the US, for example, kind of bringing that whole vision together. I think there's also an opportunity to actually show all the things that Convoy understands about what's going to happen further down in the supply chain, provide that upfront in the supply chain so you can actually make smart decisions because you know how everything is going to play out or how you think everything is going to play out, as opposed to each piece of the supply chain makes a local decision, but they don't understand the ramifications further down. I think the Convoy and Flexport partnership, we can kind of push the boundaries on what's possible and ideally set a blueprint for what we can do with other companies as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. You know, I, I think part of it is really the, the technology first approach, right? And, and of course, um, the, the, the most important thing I think that I talked about that's sort of beyond how each of us operate is how do we leverage each other companies' uh, information to make the overall better? Right. So whether it is the capacity of trucking in certain parts of the uh, domestic world, where is it? Can we send more in that location versus the other? What is the forecast for that? Similarly, from the international side, as we bring in tons of volume, right, we can share, hey, here is, um, you know, X number of TUs coming in in this port area, you know, in the next three weeks. Can you get enough people to work on it? Um, so. You know, I think the, the short-term tactical one, yeah, is really deliver that awesome internet experience because we have all the data, including our customers, right? How do we link it all together so people can just see it in real time across the board? And, but, but really to take it to the next level is really providing these things where historically, you know, this, the mega company who owns everything, they have the end-to-end -end tech that they, I'm, they've been doing it. I'm pretty sure they've been doing it for a decade. Maybe not with the best technology. Now they are shifting to the best technology. But for a service provider like us, right, we, we really have to work with each other to make that possible uh, because no one company is going to be able to buy everything out there. So, so hopefully, you know, all of us are really thinking about uh, how do we help our customer in our own segments, right, to, with the best experience. And, and this is really through uh, a true collaboration across every industry. And, and that's something that I think... Uh, you know, Convoy and Flexport really want to push to is set that vision of how the ideal collaboration can be. And then hopefully everybody will uh, make technology really frictionless, right? And then of course the business um, model or whatever the case is going for, they, they will be able to do it much better and easier. Versus today, I think a lot of investments going into like the plumbing, which is not fun for it from anybody, you know? So, uh, so those are, I think the great things that hopefully we can showcase by working together. Yeah, that's that's a good lead in. I mean, I I, I feel like uh, the plumbing is is one of those things that uh, is tough to invest in, but absolutely necessary. And and it's 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 because it's out of sight and because it it doesn't necessarily turn directly into things like that a user or a customer might see uh, straight away. Um, but but I certainly am taking notice of how much work is being done on the integration side and on the uh, on that, that coordination side between companies, really fascinating time. Um, well, how close, as we sort of push this forward, how close do you think the industry is um, to sort of come, piecing together that truly customer-centric digital experience for, for shippers? Um, and, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll sort of 
add at the end, it, it, can there be only one company that does it? Or is this a scenario where there's, you know, sort of multiple players that achieve that, that, um, that perfect, pla well, perfect is, is obviously not possible, but that platform that really is feels user centric and really digitally driven that, that has not historically existed. James, why don't you take first crack at that? Sure, one? Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like we're definitely getting close, you know, like, again, with the acceleration of digital adoption and moving, um, and there's a lot of also standards bodies out there, right? That, that that's continuing to consolidate a different segment of global trade, global logistics, so that the data will be more uniform. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, for Flexport, right? We have always been, you know, very customer centric and providing that view. Meanwhile, we try to hide all the, <laughs> the complexity behind the scenes, but ultimately deliver that experience. And, and whether it's through API, EDI, uh, email parsing, you know, PDF digitization through machine learning, um, those are a lot of the things that we've been doing with the true focus on uh, what does the customer care about. So hopefully, you know, we will continue to expand that more and more. Uh, and, and more importantly, I think the part that we haven't achieved, and I think it's going to take a while, is really collaborate with all the industry partners, right, to, to really get the information near real time. You know, there is a gap between um, the various ways of getting data and then digitize and, and give it out to customers. Uh, the other thing I, I feel um, that's a little bit, feel a little bit more game changing now a little bit is that we have a lot of these technology companies, including Flexport Convoy, right, where we're offering awesome tech to the industry to use without charging. You know, to me, that's one of the biggest barriers in this industry is that in order for you to leverage great tech, you have to pay software uh, revenue for it in order to use it. And only the big player has access to that, right? So now because the cost of building some of these is so cheap and easy to do, you know, you see more and more of the more historical enterprise software, more sophisticated, right? The pricing point keep on going lower and lower, potentially, hopefully free. Uh, but the other part that's really working really well is through our, um, not just Convoy and Flexport, right? Through most of the technology partnerships out there, uh, including Flexport, that a lot of our partners are taking advantage of our uh, technology to, to improve their operations too, right? So now there's a way to um, uh, go there. So, so, you know, it's still probably at least five years away, but, but I feel the, the, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and of course, you know, this industry is so huge. There's no way one company can, can do it all, right? So, you know, potentially it's going to be, you know, back to the uh, typical technology segments where you might have you know, a company who's like the fully integrated end to end, where you might want to have an open network that's like everybody open source. And then you have sort of the hybrid where there's a team that uh, or a company that provides the technology, but a lot of it can be used by everybody else for free. So it's controlled, not open source. Uh, so, so I think in, in, uh, in our space, it's probably going to be at least maybe three major company who might own each segment and then there's a lot of players right? but it's just so big you know there's gonna be more than um enough uh work to go around and innovate across yeah. the industry yeah i i I, com I completely agree i mean i think what i would compare it to is if you go you know 10 or so years back and you were trying to build things in telecom systems there wasn't a player like twilio and so you would have to go and integrate with each mobile carrier separately once that became a standard interface and you, you kind of didn't need to spend energy there, then a lot of innovation got unlocked. And same thing in payments with Stripe. Instead of going to each bank, you can just use a standard interface. We need to start building that in trucking because we're spending way too much time in trucking and supply chains in general, doing just this base level of data translation, data interpretation, process translation. Once we have that, there's a lot of innovation that's going to get unlocked. So that's an area that, you know, we're pushing heavily on. We want to standardize that. We want that to move a lot faster. Um, I'm super optimistic. I think the last five years, we've seen a lot of investment, a lot of technology investment come into this space, much more focus on the customer experience. But, you know, it's, it's still super early. Uh, you know, e-commerce is now... If you think about Amazon founded in 94, it's like 27 years old, still growing very, very quickly. We're just a couple of years into the technology revolution and logistics. Uh, and I think the next few years are gonna be very, very exciting. What you just said resonates with something that, that rings in my, around my head a lot. A, a founder a few years ago told me if we had, if we could do that standardization work, if we could get that out of the way, like every software company can do that. It's, I mean, it, it's not, 
it's not rocket science, right? It just takes more work and resources. If we got that out of the way, just think how fast we could accelerate what we wanted to do, right? So um, it sounds like you're right in line with, with what he's saying. We have maybe a minute left. So let's maybe end with a fun question. Um, any particular tech product or company out there um, that, that you're seeing that's doing something that makes you step back and go, cool, in our industry, of course. Ziad, why don't you start off? I mean, I, I think the one I'm really excited about is uh, kind of what's happening with vehicle technology, uh, both electric vehicles, just from a um, kind of carbon footprint uh, aspect. I think, I, think that's, I think that part is really exciting. Like if we can move both, you know, passenger vehicles as well as commercial vehicles to electric, um, I think that's probably going to happen much sooner than autonomous vehicles. That's, that's the one probably I'm most exciting. And there seems to be a lot of progress on both kind of battery, battery technology, as well as uh, just going into mass manufacturing now of uh, uh, kind of trucking. So I, I think that will be really impactful. And I think it'd be an important environmental change. James. Yeah, uh, I don't have one company in mind, but I, I think just the general trend of machine learning and AI and how fast it's improving is, is really amazing. And, and it's really going to help out with the, um, the, the planning aspect of global trade, global logistics, right? I think now with the poor congestions, with Swiss canals being stuck, you know, there's all these things that's happening. Uh, and I think eventually, pretty soon, I, I think the machine models out there can actually mirror both the, um, the physical movement and delay and give a really good idea of what does that actually mean with a high probability so people can plan it. And then um, speaking of that, I think, um, I forgot the name of the company, but the modeling of weather forecasting, for me, it's, it's pretty crazy right now. I feel like there are companies whose field they, in like two day forecast, they can get really high uh, accurate within the hour. So it's not, something like that was never possible, you know, like even five years or 10 years, we're like, no way, nobody can do that, but now it's possible. So, so I think for our industry, uh, just leveraging, you know, cool tech like that and apply it to the right problem, uh, it's going to be really, really helpful. Um, so, so I think really the, the machine learning area, uh, field itself is sort of the big area and, and it's cheap to run massive computer. It used to cost a lot of money. So now th that price point is also dropping. So it's great. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be using more and more of that over here at Flexport. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I could ask you guys probably 20 more questions, but unfortunately that is all our time. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ziad, so much for a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again to Flexport for having me. Right, thank you. Thank you.